spoons are sitting all the way there in the back. Is it because you guys have better hearing than we do? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're cool, right? You should all sit in the first row, because you can understand much better if you're sitting ahead of us. OK, um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Daniel Fabrisky visiting us for the whole week and giving this uh, CETA seminar. Daniel uh, was a Princeton graduate. He, uh, in Princeton, he worked with a number of people. He worked with Gordon Paczynski. Um, on the large scale surveys with Jeremy Gidman on uh, Cassini space in actual country systems with the start to make right, on uh, how to make close binary stars and triple star systems. And now that he's uh, IPC fellow, is that right? No, Michelson. No, 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 no. He's, uh, he's, now he's a postdoc in Harvard, CFA, CFA and working on even a much even wider range of uh, dynamical and other issues related to planets. And as I said, he's been here uh, for the last few days, and he'll be here also today and tomorrow. So find a chance to talk to him. And there should be a dinner today uh, going out with him around 6 or so. OK, thanks, Yanchen. This is not an extrasolar planet, but it's a transit of Venus across our own sun and H alpha light. And um, it illustrates what we don't see about uh, extrasolar planets, which is a little patch of light on the star gets, gets lost when a planet goes in front of it. And that's the main, that's the main uh, topic here, transiting planets, um, and what we can learn about their dynamics from these transits. So these are a number of papers I'll tell you about. Um, with these collaborators. Uh, first three at Princeton, Scott Tremaine was my advisor, uh, PhD advisor, and uh, Josh Wynn at MIT, and Matt Holman with me at CFA. OK, so this seems like really hot new stuff, but in 1952, uh, Otto Struve said we ought to be, we ought to be going out for, and looking for these planets. He suggested that, hey, I don't care what the theorists say. Let's suppose there are uh, Jupiter-mass planets in one-day orbits around their stars. Uh, and it should be stable, and we should be able to detect it. If we have uh, powerful spectrographs um, that can detect 200 meter per second accuracy through uh, the spectral lines of the star, the Doppler shift, maybe we can detect such hot Jupiters. And there would be eclipses, transits. So he had it all figured out. So we're just filling in the, uh, the details now. You didn't. No, very few people know about that. I, I saw it in a review article. Yeah. Um, but right, in the early 90s, he actually started discovering these things. Uh, the, the first hall came in through radial velocity and uh, quickly ramped up in ability. Um, it sort of leveled out, though, because the nearest stars were surveyed for these very close-in planets. And then you have to wait much longer for the orbits to close on the longer period planets. Um, but just in the last few years, people have gotten good at um, surveying tens of thousands of stars at a time with very high precision photometry and seeing the eclipses. So that's these, um, these red planets popping up. And right about now, we're at the crossing point where um, more planets are being discovered per unit time via their transits than they are uh, via their radial velocity signal they induce on the star. So when radial velocity planets came out, they had um, very surprising properties. Uh, here's one of the first highly eccentric planets. Um, the, the acceleration of the star is not a sinusoid. It has a, has a quick movement when the um, the centric planet passes periastron. And so that was ex extremely surprising that um, here, here now we have 300 planets. And uh, I've plotted the period versus the eccentricity of the known planets. Out here are our familiar gas giants and ice giants. And they have very small eccentricities, well below 0.1. And they're on long period orbits. So that's what. Um, the theories were able to, uh, to explain. That's why people made the theories. And now we need theories that also explain this whole diversity. 
So the, the two main things that are, are extremely surprising are that gas giants could get to small periods. Otto Struve notwithstanding, theorists did not predict this. Um, secondly, that they have large eccentricities, except apparently when they're very close to the star, they can get uh, quite small. And that's understand as, understood as damping due to t uh, tides. If you've been down the, the period into a histogram, um, you find a, a surprising thing that there's, there's a little bump down at the lowest periods. Like uh, the first planets that were discovered, 51 peg in that group, they actually form a separate little population of planets that's uh, right close to their stars. And there's a, a quote unquote period valley between uh, 10 days and 100 days where not many planets are found. And then, and then out as we get closer to Jupiter separations, um, then there's a lot more planets again. So I'm arguing that this is a, a separate population of planets that is being probed by the transits. Of course, um, to see transits, you need a, uh, the planet to pass periodically in front, and you can't, you can't look forever, so um, it's very advantageous for it to be on a short period close in orbit. Um, so the transits are, so far have been only probing this little spike. Now, these two surprising properties can be put together if you think that perhaps um, the thing that gives planets their eccentricities could push the eccentricity all the way close to one. In that case, the periastron passage will be very close to the star, and um, tides will get excited on the planet and also the star. And uh, if it can be damped, those tidal oscillations can be damped out, um, the orbital energy will, will go into heating the, the planet and the planet will arrive in a hot Jupiter orbit. So that's one thing we'd like to test. Is this, this bump down here uh, at three-day orbits just a result of, of tidal damping after getting to a very high eccentricity? Right, so here's some schematics of transiting planets to scale. Um, what, what you actually measure, is, of course, is the, the flux of the, the star-planet system as a function of time. None of this is resolved. Uh, you're just seeing uh, the flux go down over a period of w one or two hours. And um, it's periodic with three day period. And you interpret that in terms of s such geometries. So here are um, some follow ups from the ground. Uh, Josh Wynn and Matt Holman have gotten really good at, at measuring these light curves from the ground. Now, when you, when you put together the transit depth and the stellar radius from, from models, you can drive a planet radius. Um, and then putting together the radial velocity signal of that planet with the stellar mass gives you the planet's mass. And so you can, for the first time, form a mass, period, uh, a mass radius relationship, not just for the, the planets in our own solar system, but for um, a huge statistical sample of planets. And um, very puzzling thing is that the the models from from four or five different groups agree that a number of these planets are are too puffy. Um, we don't know why their radii are much bigger than than expected. Um, if you have only helium and uh, hydrogen and helium, that that should do the best at giving you a puffy planet. If you have a core in the planet, it should be even smaller. So to take such a model now. Okay, you can also maybe get some extra radius by uh, irradiating the, the atmosphere by putting it close to the star. But that can only get you up a little further. And so we're left with uh, the error bars on a, aren't on this plot, but there are a number of, of planets that uh, within their errors are, are considerably larger than even the most optimistic models. So we have a large radii problem for a lot of these gas giant planets. Um, and that's stimulated the theorists to come up with all sorts of models. Um, I'll be talking just about uh, one in detail. So the, the simplest things that you can imagine are just looking at the energetics. The binding energy of a, a planet is um, this quantity. So it's uh, 3 times 10 to the 43 ergs. Now this is for a typical, you know, Jupiter mass, Jupiter radius. Put it at um, 
uh, three-day orbit, and that gives you, then you can, in the presence of a star of luminosity like the sun, that would give you, uh, over the lifetime of the planet, 100 times more energy. So what it says is that you're absorbing this uh, radiation from the star, and if you can hold on to 1% of the energy that you receive uh, over the lifetime of the planet, then that's, that's sufficient to buff up the planet. However, that's really, that's really strange. How, how can you um, hold on to that energy? Um, you'd expect it to be absorbed and then re-radiated very quickly. But I'm just saying that the energetics uh, look really good. And another thing is that there's a lot of energy in the orbit of the planet about the star, um, 10 times more than the binding energy of the, of the planet. So what you can imagine is having some eccentricity uh, this is this, this idea. Um, having some eccentricity to the planet, which gets stamped out. And in conserving angular momentum, that gives you uh, uh, a shorter period orbit closer to the star, and that would heat up the planet, uh, probably down deep where the tides are being dissipated. And so um, typical numbers work out well for that. However, it's a, it's a one-time thing. You would have an eccentric planet that damps out and then you're done. It, it cools off and to shrink back down again. Um, so another idea is perhaps there's some, some resonance that can keep you in, um, not in a centric orbit, but an oblique orbit. Um, just like the Earth is tilted over 23 degrees, so per perhaps some of these planets are tilted very far. And uh, in, the, in the frame of the, the gas of the planet, um, you feel a, a pulsating tide that could heat up the planet. Um, so I, I wanted to explore, explore this a little more. So I uh, developed a model to look at it in detail. Oh, let me uh, step back one minute about um, how much irradiation these planets receive. Um, models were done early on when the first transiting planets came out to describe how the energy absorbed by such a planet is uh, redistributed around the planet, what kind of wind is set up, and um, the models, a lot of the models predict an eastward flowing wind at the equator, and this could carry the, uh, the hot spot that's imprinted on the, on the planet to the, to the east, that is um, rotating faster than the, the orbit of the planet, the super rotating wind. And that's actually been observed with Spitzer. Um, if you look at the flux of the, of the system in the infrared, you'll see a, a giant primary eclipse, that's the planet going in front of the star, and then a secondary eclipse, the, the planet going behind the star. So you've measured the light coming from the planet itself. If you zoom into that, that region there, you'll, you find that um, it's not constant during the orbit as the planet goes around from primary eclipse to secondary eclipse. It's not uh, constantly bright. So then you can mock up a model of the, the surface um, longitudinal brightness of the planet. So it conforms with the theory, uh, which is a really fabulous result. So we know that there's, even observationally, there's indications that there's large-scale winds on these planets. And so, uh, so maybe that 1%, there's something to it that you could, you, but you need to ingest that energy, not just blow it around the planet. So, so far, I have not seen a convincing theoretical model of, of that that uh, how to ingest the energy from the star to buff up the planet. Um, so instead, I'll work on um, something which you can make a, a pretty simple model for. That is the, the tidal interaction between the star and planet. So I, I just wanted to study if you could trap the, the planet spin in a resonance, keeps it, um, keeps it oblique. Hot Jupiters, these close-in planets, um, physically they're spinning gaseous bodies, and uh, that, that means that they're not perfectly round. They have a bulge at the equator. Um, if you put that in the uh, tidal gravitational field of the star, um, that, that causes the spin to process about the, the um, normal vector of the orbit. And then also, the star raises a a uh, football-shaped, an American football-shaped uh, bulge on the planet, and that 
due to tidal dissipation, will trail the position of the star. Um, so if this planet's spinning faster than the orbit, the, the bulge gets pushed away from the star. And this puts a, a tidal torque um, between the two bodies. This has um, a few interesting effects. One of them is that the, the spin of the star, uh, planet should align with the orbit normal. Um, that's called parallelization. And for typical numbers, it, it should take less than a million years, very fast. Um, another consequence is spin synchronization. It shouldn't just, the vector shouldn't just align, uh, but the, the magnitude should be the same. The, the motion of the planet around the star should synchronize with the spin of the planet. Finally, um, in such a state, the, the eccentricity of the planet's orbit should um, damp away. But that takes longer, and it's highly dependent on how close the planet is um, to the star. So the picture is, you don't just get precession of the spin axis. You also uh, spiral in towards, towards the axis, and they become aligned and synchronized. Um, and while all this is, is going on, all this tidal damping, heat is generated inside the planet, perhaps buffing it up. OK, so uh, what kind of resonance can we imagine for the, for the obliquity? If instead of um, processing about the, the orbit normal, which is fixed in space, you imagine that something is causing the, the orbit normal itself to process. So this is kind of like a quantum mechanics uh, notation, spin of a, the planet, the orbital angular momentum, and the total angular momentum. Um, so imagine something is causing this to process. Now the spin, it, it wants to find the um, the orbit at any given time, but the orbit's a moving target. So what does it choose for its equilibrium obliquity? That equilibrium ob obliquity won't have uh, theta equals zero. It will have some non-zero obliquity, and this is called a Cassini state, a tidally damped um, but resonantly driven obliquity. And it's, the value of this theta will depend on the, the rate at which the orbit processes and the rate at which the, the spin would naturally process about the orbit. So if you're, if you're only causing slow precession to the orbit, it, uh, the obliquity is happy being at zero. But if you, if you process the orbit very quickly, then the, the spin just wants to align along the average orbit. So then you'll, then you'll get this, uh, this behavior. Now, if you change the parameters of the system, you will uh, and continue tidal damping, you can run along one of these, these curves. For instance, you'll, you'll end up in a uh, completely tilted over state, so-called Cassini state two, with the spin axis in the plane of the orbit. Um, so this is it's not at all unprecedented. In fact, the, the moon is in Cassini state two. Um, it's not tilted over that far because it's processing so quickly. So um, here's, a, here's a movie of the moon over one month as the sun, okay, the sun is uh, illuminating and sweeping over it. But if I do it again, you'll notice the moon itself gets smaller and then bigger. That's just a matter of the eccentricity of the moon. But also, if I do it one more time, watch how the, um, the image rotates. Okay, so that's a symptom of the uh, spin axis not being along the orbital axis. It's actually, it's, a, it's tilted off by six degrees. And this is Cassini state two in action for our moon. Um, so the uh, Cassini, for whom there's a satellite around uh, Saturn now named, he, he came up with three laws of the motion of the moon. Um, there was synchronous rotation. Um, there was a, a constant obliquity even though from our perspective it doesn't look constant. And uh, the, the three vectors I showed you previously are coplanar, even as they process around. Okay, so here's, here's those three vectors. And there's a, an extra angle um, telling you how non-coplanar the system is. And so you can um, have this, these tidally coupling, tidal couplings um, put into an integrator and, and see how the different angles behave. So this is a, a quick damping to the Cassini state on the time scale of like 10 to the 5 years. Uh, uh, 
it would be 10 to the 5 years if I used uh, standard parameters. But here, I wanted to just see the behavior of this Cassini state too. So I actually had to pick funny parameters to do so. Um, but nevertheless, I found Cassini state 2, the code, um, and watch, watch uh, as tidal, tidal heat is sapped from the orbit in this, in this spin resonance. Now, if you go for long enough, you'll notice that um, the, the equilibrium breaks and tidal heating ends. Um, so this is a, this is a matter of um, what's causing the precession of, of the, angular, the orbital angular momentum. It needs to be something that's non-coplanar with the planet that you're trying to heat up. So it could be the rotational bulge of the star that could do the job, or it could be a non-coplanar second planet that could do it too. Um, it turns out what I what I had in these integrations was the the bulge of the star doing the job, and to even find the state stable, I needed to pick funny values for the planet. Um, for instance, the planet had to be uh, extremely centrally concentrated, um, not not like what we expect at all from the models. Um, so, so that it doesn't work for for uh, sensible parameters for the star to be doing the precession. But how about a second planet? Can can that work? Well, there's this uh, famous the first discovered transiting planet w was one of these is one of these um, planets that is too puffy, and so I thought, why don't we try to explain that particular one? But the second planet that you introduce to cause this precession needs to be both massive and misaligned enough to absorb angular momentum from the tidally dissipating planet. But it also has to be close enough um, to compete with the, the tidal torque uh, uh, trying, to, trying to realign the spin of the planet with the orbit. And if you, those constraints are, are shown by these, these arrows on these lines in um, semi-major axis versus uh, mass of the second planet space. But then again, there's radial velocity uh, measurements that tell you that there, there aren't very massive close-in planets, um, second, second planets that can be doing this precession. So for this system, um, you, can, you can rule out the Cassini state um, as having, ha having this uh, puffing effect. So for the best constrained system, we we can totally rule out this uh, obliquity tides, this resonance as, as an inflation mechanism. And um, it could be that it's, uh, it's viable in the future, but then you make very stringent constraints about what the second planet has to be um, and should be able to detect it with radial velocity. So for now, there's no evidence that um, any, of the, any of the puffy planets are inflated this way. So um, how did the planets get there in the first place? Well, um, I said that you could, you could imagine a story where you excite the eccentricity and the tidal damping takes over and brings the planet close to the star. Um, that, that, that's a pretty interesting story for planets in binary systems. Um, here's, a, here's a plot of all the known planets that orbit one star of a binary stellar system and the separation versus the, the system number. So um, the separation of the stars are, are here, and then here's the planets that orbit the in interior star. Um, so what is the effect of this sec the second star orbiting around? Well, if you imagine that um, you, you lay down the planet in any random orientation, it's pretty likely that the, the plane of the planet is um, skewed very non-coplanar with the, the plane of the uh, the stellar binary. And in that case, um, the torque that the, the stellar binary puts on the, on the orbit of the planet um, can cause very interesting evolution called Kozai cycles. So I'll describe that right now. Um, it's a secular interaction, and you're not changing the semi-major axis of the, of the planet, but the eccentricity can oscillate very dramatically if um, these two planes, the, the planetary plane and the, the outer star's plane, are non-coplanar. So um, it causes the paracenter to oscillate around, and in concert with that, the eccentricity varies. So um, 
how could we tell such a thing happened? Well, the, the star in the middle, presumably, um, it'll start off with its axis along the, the orbit normal of the planet. Where you think that, well, that's true of the sun. The sun's only seven degrees away from the um, orbit normal of Jupiter, which has most of the angular momentum. Um, and we think that planets are born in disks. The disks feed the central star. And uh, so both the angular momentum of the planet and the star uh, probably comes from the same source initially. But in, in this kind of evolution, uh, that direction that the star sets by its spin axis um, serves as a reference for how, how much that planet got torqued around during this migration episode. So uh, distant planets will, will not stay coplanar with the uh, equator plane of the star. However, once the, once the planet gets in close to the star somehow um, and becomes a hot Jupiter, then it processes very quickly due to the t uh, rotational bulge of the star. And the, the effect of the outer binary is not um, doesn't change that. So um, here's the dramatic evolution I was talking about. Suppose you start off with this mutual inclination as high as 60 degrees and, uh, and watch it over very long time scales. Um, the eccentricity rises periodically to a very high level. And uh, this, was, this was proposed in particular for that first very eccentric um, exoplanet, which I showed you the radial velocity curve of. Um, this mechanism does, it does matter what else is going on in the system. If the planet's so close that uh, GR precession is fast, then the, the maximum eccentricity you can get out of this evolution as a function of inclination um, gets suppressed. So if you start off uh, without considering other precession in the system, if you start off at the two planes perpendicular, then you're gonna get driven to unity eccentricity. And that's good for the story that I developed. Um, you can get down towards the star by tides and become hot Jupiter. But if uh, GR is too strong in that system, then you, uh, you can't get up to the, those high eccentricities. Now this uh, paper in 1962 by Kozai, it was a paper on asteroids. Um, it's kind of detailed and, and uh, specialized, but it has a very interesting property that all the theorists needs to get very, very high eccentricities is to start off with non-coplanar uh, orbits. And then you can, you can get this really interesting behavior. So uh, for the theorists in the audience, if you need some eccentricity, just give me some inclination. And, uh, and you can do, and the, the citations go up and up <laughs> as, people, as the theorists realize that. Um, so of course, if the paracenter plunges down towards the star, uh, you're going to have to take into account these tidal effects. So um, I have a set of equations from uh, Eggleton and Kisleva Eggleton um, that, that implement the, the tidal bulges, the dissipation, um, follow the spins of both the star and the planet as they're torqued around, um, and also put in the GR precession, which I said was important. So if you start off with um, high inclinations near perpendicular of 90, uh, you'll get high eccentricities. The paracenter, um, as a function of time, goes down to close to the star, and that pulls in the semi-major axis, too, um, just by tidal dissipation, not by the, not by the uh, torques between the planet and the star, but by tidal dissipation. So then um, you can end up quite close to the star in a hot Jupiter orbit. Um, and then there's that diagnostic angle I mentioned, the angle between the star's spin and the the orbit normal of the planet. And that, during this evolution, oscillates wildly. And eventually, once the, star, the planet shrinks down to become a hot Jupiter, it stabilizes at a particular value. Um, so here's, here's how, how to say that. Um, you could think of it as the stellar obliquity. It's the, it's the spin axis of the star's angle from the, from the orbit normal. Um, so if I don't work with, if I throw away the orbits and only think in vectors, um, we, we have here the, the outer star's orbit, the planet's orbit, and the, and the inner star's um, spin. Okay, the outer star torques the, the planet's orbit around. It processes around it like that. And then it becomes a hot Jupiter. Um, and it seals in this large value of the stellar obliquity. So 
you can um, come up with a, a series of systems and follow them all to this endpoint where you have a, a, a very large obliquity and, and produce the, the distribution of obliquities that this theory of hot Jupiter formation um, predicts. So uh, I did just that, and it gives you a huge distribution out beyond 90 degrees. That is a retrograde planet. Um, the, the material of the star is moving one way. The hot Jupiter is moving the other way in this picture. So um, this is called the spin orbit angle in the literature. And uh, one can imagine if, if disk migration, uh, that is, torques between the protoplanetary disk and, and, the, and the newborn planet are what deliver most planets to close in orbits, um, you would expect alignment between um, the spin and the orbit or, or uh, stellar obliquities of about zero. But here's the distribution that I expect from um, what's called COSI migration. And uh, there's this, this an another theory, an intermediate theory, where um, planets scatter off one another, uh, have, have close passages to one another. And a lot of people have worked on that very recently. And they're predicting what the distributions are for the stellar obliquity, too. So the situation right now is that um, three sets of theorists have gone after it. And they all make. Um, They'll make you know different initial conditions and, and different assumptions about how you become a hot Jupiter, um, and right now it, it's the answer is sort of murky. The, the they don't predict a, a a very clear answer for what the stellar obliquity should be. But um, so here here are two um, cumulative distributions versus inclination, and they sort of top out around 40 degrees. It's very rare to get above 40 degrees for these these two um, integrations. But yet a, a, a third integration shows um, all over the map just about as many retrograde planets as you um, have prograde planets. And further, this set of theorists say, say that all hot Jupiters could be explained by planet-planet um, scattering plus tidal dissipation. So um, it's really interesting to try to test this. Does the inclination of what? Is, is the planet in the same plane as the star? It's causing the cosine cycle? Uh, no, no, it has to start off inclined. But after tidal dancing, does it work? At the very end, at the end of the evolution? At the end of the evolution, the, the two orbits are completely, um, well, they're, they're correlated, but they're not coplanar at the end. The stars, the outer stars orbit in the inner planet's orbit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, they prefer this angle of 40 or 140 <coughs> degrees. Um, but I want to tell you about uh, the stellar obliquity, because that's actually measurable in transiting planets. Um, the technique is a spectroscopic technique, wherein the um, planet blocks the, the blue shifted part of the photosphere. The star is rotating, and, the, and half of it's coming at you, and the other half's going away. And so as the planet marches across and masks that out, you get an anomalous blue shift or red shift as a function of time. Um, so for instance, here's, here's um, that planet that I showed you with a observed wind on it. Um, it. It looks very well aligned. It has the signature, according to the model, of a very good alignment. Um, the unfortunate part about this is that you, you don't have the full angle accessible to you observationally. You just have a sky projection of that um, angle. So, it's not the true stellar obliquity anymore. It's just a sky projection of that. And this is what um, they call lambda. So I teamed up with uh, the most prolific observer, Josh Wynn, um, on this topic to try to uh, confront the theories with this lambda distribution. So right now there's 11 um, discovered planets with this measurement done. And there's a wide variety of error bars on the um, measurement. but. 10 out of 11 are consistent with zero um, projected stellar obliquity. So, so intuitively, that, okay, first of all, there's one that's not zero. So that, that tells you that um, if the projected obliquity is not zero, the true obliquity is not zero either. So that's an interesting thing to study dynamically on its own. But as a distribution, this looks nothing like what Cosi cycles predicts, for instance. So um, 
the, the inference is that COSI migration is rare for planetary systems. And uh, scattering models, I said that the theorists were disagreeing. Well, they're constrained by this kind of observation. Now, I want to make some sort of model independent statement about that. So, um, well, at least scattering model independent. So let's take a few guesses at what this distribution might be. Um, it could have a form that's uh, centered around some characteristic angle and has some characteristic spread, like a, a Rayleigh distribution. That's, that's what that's called. Or you can imagine perhaps there's two populations of planets, one that uh, has an isotropic um, stellar of liquidies. That is, the, is, is completely uncorrelation. There's no correlation between the direction of the um, stellar spin and the, and the planetary orbit normal. Okay, a fraction of systems like that, and the, and the rest of them are perfectly aligned. Perhaps they're due to disk migration. Okay, so there's two, two guesses. And we can constrain both, based on those 11 measurements, you can constrain the parameters that go into the, those two guesses. So the constraints for this, uh, this broad distribution, um, here's a, it's, it's, a, it's a Bayesian uh, inversion. You have, a, you have this model that, that you can project onto the sky, then you compare it with the data, then you constrain the parameters of the model. And so here's a probability distribution for the parameter, uh, the width parameter, given the data. And uh, it, it quickly peters out past about 24 degrees. That's beyond 24 degrees for this width parameter is ruled out at 95% confidence. Um, so that, that uh, rules out COSI cycles as being the origin of all hot Jupiters. Okay, and then um, over here, this model, of course, since there's only one misaligned planet that's not consistent with perfect alignment, um, that, that's what shows up here. The most likely value for this, this F, the fraction, is one-tenth, and it, it falls off quickly, and, and above 36%, is ruled out at 95% confidence. So that means um, if you take the Nagasawa et al.'s scattering model, which gives you pretty much isotropic stellar obliquities, and say, what fraction of hot Jupiters can come from that? The answer is, at most, about 36% to 95% confidence. And so this is work with Josh Wynn. So before you go on, yes. I mean, of course, it makes an assumption that the stellar spin is not changed at all. So that's right. So in your evolution, that there's an absolutely zero mass transfer from the planet ever, I mean, it never fills this Roche law. That that's Even a good. Up, up, okay. Up and so, on. so for the, those the grad students in the back, <laughs> the question is, um, can that stellar velocity change over time uh, due to some dramatic mass transfer event or something else? People have talked about is um, tidal dissipation. Like I showed you, uh, you would need tidal dissipation not not in the planet, but in this case in the star. So the answer is, um, those things are possible, but the, the first cut theories say no, they're, they, they're not important. OK, so. Um, but the, the Rochelle overflow you actually checked. I mean, Rochelle overflow. So, right? so the, no, so the Rochelle the overflow, the, the, um, it's going to have a hard time reorienting the star. There's not enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so how about multiple planets? Um, this is something we'd like to go after because there's lots of known radial velocity discovered systems uh, that have multiple planets known. But in fact, there's no known transiting, uh, transiting planets that have companions. So here, here's just a rank ordering of the period of the inner planet in, in radial velocity discovered systems. And you see that a lot of these close-in planets do have companions out here at longer periods. And uh, in the transiting planets, we just haven't seen them yet. So pretty much it's, it's a detection bias. People have only so far confirmed the planet that was discovered through these transiting surveys. They haven't spent, the, uh, spent a few years or even a few months checking with radial velocity for, for other companions. Um, something that you could do just by following up the transits um, is transit time variations. If you were an alien looking at the solar system and watching Venus go in front or Earth go in front, then the, the interval between um, passages varies because the planets are perturbing each other gravitationally. And so um, it could be 
uh, hundreds and thousands of seconds for the solar system planets. And so if you just put us back on the Earth and look at the extrasolar planets, you would ask, um, uh, given an extrasolar planet and a given timing precision for the when the transits occur, um, what second planets could you rule out? Now, it, it's a pretty complicated function. Here's the timing precision, 100 seconds. Uh, this is supposing that we put, um, we have two Jupiter mass planets and uh, P1 is the period of the inner, uh, inner guy. So let's put a second planet on the outside and uh, see, see what, see what uh, timing signal you get from that second Jupiter mass planet. Um, so you can, you can have a pretty good analytic theory for, for what's produced by numerical integrations. Um, if you give that second outer planet different eccentricities, you get various, various results. But um, the upshot is, if you, if you have a period ratio less than, say, 10, um, you, you get a, uh, a big signal and, and it, it falls quickly as the separation chain, um, grows. But there's also these really nice spikes at, at resonant locations. So wherever these integer, these ratio, these, uh, ratio of periods are integers, the um, perturbations from one planet to the other is stronger. And you can expect to have a b uh, bigger measurable effect. So uh, one place to look for this that would, is really exciting is GJ436. Now there's, there's about 40 known hot Jupiters transiting, but there's only one known hot Neptune. Um, it, it was discovered over a year ago and there haven't been any more. Um, so this is, this is really interesting because uh, it, it gives us the first window into the size of an ice giant. Um, should be comparable to Neptune and Uranus in, in its composition and whatnot. Um, that is about half rock and about half um, gaseous envelope. Um, and so we, we have the first window into the size of a Neptune mass planet. But also, it's, it's pretty light, so it's easy to perturb around if you have another planet in resonance with it. Um, so there's, there's a funny, there's a funny uh, thing about this planet, which is that its eccentricity is 0.15. And if you take the, the tidal dissipation parameters from Uranus and Neptune and just transplant them to the system, say um, tides in this, in this planet behave just like tides in Uranus and Neptune that are driving the, their um, satellites out. We have constraints on how the satellites have moved over time. If you use the same parameters for this system, you get, you get a crazy result. The eccentricity should have damped out long ago. So. Um, in fact, it's, it's, uh, if you, you need about 100 times bigger um, tidal dissipation parameter. In other words, to say it, the rate of tidal dissipation has to be 100 times slower than that inferred for Neptune and Uranus for this, uh, the eccentricity of this planet to make sense. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of uh, other circumstantial things that are, that are interesting about this system. Um, the system was discovered by radial velocity in 2004 but not detected to transit. And then three years later, it was detected to transit, but it did so at a very high impact parameter. It just skimmed the star near the limb. So um, perhaps it actually, the orbit actually reoriented over those three years. And there's a reason why we didn't see it in 2004 be beyond uh, systematic noise. Um, so if you put these two things together, you might think that there is a perturbing planet causing the, the known transiting planet to torque around. Um, and Rivas et al. said that there should be a second planet and they claim to see something in the, re the residuals to the radial velocity. Um, so they did a, a, a two planet fit to the radial velocity and, and uh, found that the second planet that they suppose is there uh, had a period of close to two to one. So it should be close to one of these resonances that gives you a huge transit time signal. Um, and also, at the time they, they wrote this, uh, the mass of that inferred second planet was smaller than any known. So it was really, it was a really uh, they were sticking at their neck out. And in fact, you can easily rule this out by um, transit time variations. That 
<coughs> if you calculate what their system would do to the, the times at which transits occur, um, the, the data here are the phase. This is the deviation from a linear ephemeris, or a constant period for that transiting planet. Um, in seconds, here's the data. And the system proposed by that group um, would, would I, 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 cha I fiddled the phase and everything to make it fit as good as possible. But if you, zoom, if you zoom out, here's the theoretical curve, and here's the data. So obviously, there's no evidence for this particular perturbing planet. And uh, if you just scale down the mass of that perturber until it, it does reasonably fit the data, um, you find that you're sensitive to th things that are just like four times the mass of the moon. Um, so we, we could detect as a perturber to GJ436 something with the mass like just a few times that of Earth's moon, um, just a few percent of Earth's mass. Now this is assuming a very special orbit. It's, it's uh, in the two to one resonance, which is a very strong resonance. It's got a very large libration cycle around that resonance. Um, so that's why it's, it's really easy to constrain. Um, however, of course, with a, with a mass four times the mass of the moon, that wouldn't be able to do anything to the eccentricity of the transiting planet. Um, it, the transiting planet would barely see that planet. So it, it couldn't excite this eccentricity. Um, now that's just an example. Suppose you take that as a function of uh, as a function of semi-major axis of putative a putative second planet that's perturbing um, the planet into a high eccentricity state, and and look at every semi-major axis, put a limit and mass of that second planet, compare it to what you would need to excite the eccentricity. Well, it sounds like a, pro a big project, and that's what I'm doing now with Matt Holman and Josh Wynn, um, trying to generalize this this concept that. Um, uh, the eccentricity, perhaps it isn't primordial and being damped. Perhaps it is excited by a second planet. However, we can constrain second planets with transit timing and with uh, radial velocity measurements. And uh, confronting those two is what I'm up to right now. Okay. Um, one thing that we can't learn from the radial velocity planets is what the, the inclination of the planet is. Um, just knowing how the star is moving in the radial direction only gives you the mass of the planet times the sign of the inclination. And even if you had two planets around a star, that's all you can measure. You can't measure their, uh, their individual inclinations, and you can't measure if they're, if they're rotated with respect to each other through the, uh, an angle on the sky. So, but this is a, a really important question for uh, planetary formation and evolution. Um, are the planets around other stars like the planets of the solar system. That is, are they um, reasonably coplanar like you would expect if they were born in a disk? Um, so here's an idea for how we can actually, um, once we find a second planet around one of these transiting uh, planet hosts, how can we measure the mutual inclination between those planets? Okay, so here's, here's a cartoon of a of a star with two planets around it, a green planet and a, and a brown planet orbit. And then if you're looking from this side, you would see just the green planet transiting. All right? Um, you can do this transit time variation stuff, very precisely measure when the, when the planet comes uh, across the limb of the star and across the other limb, and um, measure the phase of the orbit very precisely that way. And so, Due to the perturbations from the from the brown planet to the green planet, um, measured with this on orbital time scales with these phase shifts, you can measure the mass and therefore the true uh, line of sight inclination of the, the brown planet's orbit. And and for instance, the semi-major axis in eccentricity. Um, th this assumes that you also have a radial velocity detection of the second planet, so that you know its mass and you can back out its the sign of its inclination. Okay, and then um, that's on orbital time scales, but if you wait a number of years, the two planets torque each other if they're not coplanar, um, and, and the, the planet sweeps, would sweep across the face of the star. So on secular time scales, the, the chord length changes. You're moving the, the, uh, the orbit away from the center of the star or towards the center of the star. 
And you can measure that quite precisely because you know how long the, the transit lasts in time. Translate that to a chord length and then you know where you are, where that orbit is cutting the star. Um, if you observe that on long time scales, you can see how these planets are changing each other's orbits. And that gives you uh, cosine of the, the um, relative nodal angle. That's um, uh, how they're oriented on the, on the sky relative to one another. So you're taking the dynamical torque and using the mass of the, no, uh, the brown planet and uh, inferring what the, what the angle is. So if you put these together, you can, you can measure the mutual inclination. Um, so, other ideas, not, not having to do with um, transiting planets, to measure the mutual inclination is, is sending up, for instance, the um, SIM Planet Quest, an astrometry mission that's planned to go into space, and it will detect two-dimensional orbits for the, for the planets um, on the sky, from which you can infer a three-dimensional orbit for each individual planet in a multi-planet system. And uh, from that, you should be able to tell the mutual inclination between planets. And, there, and uh, for the very closest planets and the most massive planets, you can already start to do that with um, Hubble Space Telescope. So there are some mutual inclinations starting to leak out, but um, I think we'll need, to, we'll need to discover lots of two-planet systems with one of them transiting and use this technique before uh, we'll get a very large number of those. To compare with the solar system. Okay, the question is for planets in resonance, can you get the mutual inclination faster? I guess. Right? Uh, and um, I haven't looked into it in detail. You need the right resonance so that um, the inclinations can play a role. It's not a first order resonance, but yeah, presumably you could. It'd be a good, good thing to try. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to talk about your stuff. <laughs> okay, so I, I have a... Uh, I'm going to wrap it up. All right. Um, another thing that would be cool to do if you had two planets, one of them transiting, is uh, determine how fast extra, how fast the inner planet is processing um, in an anomalous fashion, just like Mercury. Uh, we measured all the torques on the planet and found out that it was processing too fast, and that was attributed eventually to GR. So in these exoplanets, something that's important is um, the tidal bulge that the star raises on the planet. And um, with transiting planets, you can actually measure the interactions uh, on short time scales between, between two planets and try to back out that extra procession. So, um, and you know the radius of a transiting planet and so hopefully you could back out the tidal parameters, that is the degree of distortion of, of uh, close-in planets. That, that could tell you, for instance, how centrally concentrated a planet is for comparison with the models. You wouldn't just have the radius of the planet um, to compare with models. You could also have the central concentration, which would be a huge leap forward. Um, okay, so to, to finish up, what, what, can, what interesting dynamics can we do with transiting planets? Well, the radial velocity surveys have produced some really um, surprising results about eccentricities and periods of gas giants. And uh, that's motivated people to construct explanatory theories. How come hot Jupiters are there? Why are planets eccentric? Um, and the claim is that transiting planets are a, a really great um, way to constrain those, those theories. And, and it's... Um, really exciting time to be in this in this business. Then when you look at the planets, you uh, see they're too puffy and you need other explanations. So science marches on, giving us yet more interesting problems to, to play with. So uh, with that, I'll finish up. Thanks.
No, it's still true that no transiting planets are, have um, second planets known. Also, There's about f four or five systems with transiting planets where a second star is known, for which Kozai migration might be applicable. No, no second planets, no. So, this, for instance, is there a star for the, the one object that actually was 90 degrees where the star was? No, there? okay, so, so that, that one is XO3. Right. And um, it's, it's lambda, this projected spin orbit is 70 plus or minus 15 degrees. Um, it has no known stellar companion. It's also very massive. It's about 11 or 12 Jupiter masses. So you'd expect if there was some scattering event that happened, uh, whatever did that scattering has to be pretty massive to have moved that planet. So. Um, so it's a really interesting thing to keep following that with uh, radial velocities. Look in the with AO observations, for instance, for for uh, another star. It's actually bizarre. If it's that massive, it could probably have torqued that star. It, it, could it, could it have torqued? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great idea. So um, he says, since it's the most massive one with this lambda measurement, um, and it's misaligned, that tells you that. Uh, it could have torqued its star. So that's a good empirical constraint showing that probably the other planets have not torqued their stars. So those um, lambda measurements being zero are probably actually primordial, even empirically. I want to make a comment on that last question. So GJ436, though, has a long-term RV moving the trend. Went away. What? Yeah, so. I'll talk to you about that. Okay. A Andrew Cumming, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the the um, the California Carnegie Group have re-reduced the data, and they don't they don't see that trend anymore. So as far as we know, GJ436 is um, is uh, a single planet. Yes. Uh, just a technical question. What are the main um, limitations right now? The width of transits? Oh, okay. So the current limits from the ground, it depends on the system highly, but um, for GJ436, it's about 20 seconds. Um, for, for the worst ones, it's about three or four minutes. Amateurs can do it good to about 15 minutes. Um, from, from space, you can do... Uh, as little as five seconds for some of the better, with HST, for some of the better um, candidates. And of course, there's dedicated transit missions now. Caro and Kepler's going up next year. So they should um, have really great transit timing uh, results. Uh, Caro is already putting out really, really um, precise transit times on the order of seconds. Does photon noise matter? Does photon noise matter? Uh, no, in, in, I think in none of the cases I just mentioned is it photo, photon noise limited. There's always little um, systematics that are hard to track down. Um, in the case of Caro 2, I believe it, Caro XO2, it has really huge star spots. So you have to um, take care of whether you're transiting the limb of the star or whether you're, uh, you're hitting a star spot right at the edge of the star. 